So welcome everyone. I am Rebecca Vanuk, the Executive Director of Library Reads, and I don't want to take up too much time out of our program for a little commercial about Library Reads. So if you are not already familiar with us, please visit our website, which is www.librarireads.org, where you can find our monthly top 10 list, as well as all kinds of information on how you can join us in creating that list if you work in a public library in the United States. So libraryreads.org, please check us out. But now let's get started officially. This is the 19th installment of the Mystery at the Library Book Club series brought to you by Sourcebooks and Baker and Taylor. I am thrilled to be here tonight with J.P. Smith, critically acclaimed author of The Summoning. So before we begin officially, I do have our usual housekeeping notes to share. If you have questions for JP tonight, and we know you do, you're the best audience I've ever worked with, utilize the Google form that will be linked shortly in the chat box. He's going to answer your questions later in the evening, so you've got some time as he and I are talking at the beginning. Go ahead and come up with those questions and send them our way. When you ask a question or if you participate in our trivia poll that happens midway through, you'll be entered to win a mystery book bundle. And as a special delight for tonight, everyone uh, who is in attendance tonight is automatically entered to win a $25 gift card just for being here tonight. The winners will be announced at the conclusion, so stick around. So all of that out of the way, let's begin with a little bit about JP. JP Smith was born in New York City, raised five minutes from the Bronx, and began his career when he moved to England, living with his wife and daughter in London, Lyme Regis, and Cambridge for over five years before his first novel was initially published there. As a screenwriter, he was an Academy Nickel Fellowship semifinalist in 2014. He's a member of Penn America and the Authors Guild. He currently lives four minutes from the Atlantic Ocean on the North Shore of Massachusetts. Thank you so much, JP, for joining us this evening. How are you tonight? I'm well, thanks, and thanks for having me. It's great, great to be thanks here with you. Thanks for being here. We're so excited. So I actually just finished this over the weekend. So my head is, of course, full of all of these characters, and we've got mm -hmm. all kinds of questions. So if you're ready, let's just jump right let's, into talking let's about do the it. book. Let's okay, do it. great. Absolutely. So the summoning. This is about an actor who actually makes her living as a medium until things get a little too realistic for her. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about how you decided to write about a not so phony medium. Let's talk about well, when, when I was living in England, I wanted to write about a medium and I couldn't find my way into it. I was kind of influenced by two movies. One was from 1964 seance on a wet afternoon about a couple living outside of London and she's a medium and they devise a scheme a money-making scheme that goes completely wrong and I thought that's fast it's a fascinating movie by Brian Forbes with Kim Stanley who won an Academy Award for that and uh, Richard Attenborough and there's another movie that influenced me because I'm influenced by movies as well as books called Don't Look Now with Donald Sutherland and Julie sure. Christie which I've is about, movie. of course, I've seen it. I see it once a year. And the, <laughs> the daughter, the a daughter drowns, and they go to Venice to try to heal their marriage. And there's a medium in there who happens to be blind, but they keep the wife keeps seeing, sensing that the daughter is still there with them, and that also goes in a bad, very, very bad way. And I couldn't find my way into it. But about a year and a half ago, I thought, what if an actor, who needs to make a living. Her husband died 9-11. He was a, he was a, lying, a lying chef at, at Windows on the World, the restaurant on top of the North Tower, which of course fell. And also her daughter is in a coma and she has to make a living and she's not getting a lot of roles. And she thinks, you know, I can do this. It's performative art and I can call people. And that's what created for me this great tension between I'm a con artist, but I can bring people comfort because I'm good at this. And she can bring people comfort because you don't know if the dead can come back. That's the great mystery 
I had a writer friend in England, Beryl Bainbridge, the very famous Dame Beryl Bainbridge, mm -hmm. when she died. And she, I once said to her, you know, all your books sort of end in death and tragedy. She said, well, it's a great mystery, isn't it? We don't know. And that's the final mystery for all authors. Hamlet talks about it in, in the play. So I thought, well, create this tension where she does these seances and can recreate the voices because she's an actor mm -hmm. and she brings people comfort. And then suddenly she realizes she's got a foot in two worlds, one in the world of the living and one in the world of the dead. And that's the, that creates for me the ambiguity because you might say, a reader might say, gee, she's, she's terrible. She's taking advantage of people. And then the reader would say, gee, she's really helping people. But that's what I like about character. All of my books begin with character. Not only two have begun with plot. Okay. Character is very, very important for me. Mm -hmm. the, and the only two that begin with plot, airtight and the drowning, were based on events from my own life. One case from a, something that happened to me in college in the '60s, and then the drowning, something that happened to me when I was eight years old, and I developed them into stories. But primarily, I deal with character, and I like characters that are not not one or the other there's a kind of a gray area and that is and, absolutely kit for sure She's, yes it is yes i i definitely like from the very first chapter i got that sense that she she's not a bad person right but she's not a good person either right. and the more the more i yeah. read the more i liked her because i yes. did feel like you said she is trying to give these folks some comfort She's trying to give yes. them closure and it's closure that she never had. So that's I that's exactly right. I could I could I really got that from her. That's right. right. And she yeah. keeps, if you remember early in the book, she keeps seeing her husband in yes. New York City mm -hmm. in, in different mm -hmm. situations because she's still there. She hasn't let go yet. Yes. So that it's kind of a perfect storm of of an actor and and this this world she she works in. And she brings people comfort. Mm -hmm. And they don't, she doesn't ask for money. She asks for donations. Yes. She, she has to stay on this side of the law, of course. That Until, I, when, that was, I thought that was really clever that she never, she, it was like, never. just, if I won't take any money the first time, the first one's always free, right? That's right. <laughs> and then That's right. leave the money as you, as you, as you walk out the door, right. do not put it in my hand. We're not talking prices. Like she knows just enough to, to stay ahead of it. That's, yeah. that's yeah. exactly right. And then one day she meets a detective in a bar yeah. and then things start to go in a very different direction for her. Yes. Yes. But she's essentially a very, a good person. That was the feeling that I got after getting to know her a little bit at first I was like oh no scam artist oh no picking on you know people who are grieving and then once you realize I mean you get that so quickly right away that she is also grieving and yes. she is also you know needy and and needs some closure and so that was a really a, a brilliant setup I think and having yes. having a, an accomplished actor you could sort of see that, oh, sure, she's the perfect kind of person who could get away with this, for lack of a better phrase. But, you know, she okay. could do it because she's trained. And actors are very also, you know, not just trained in being a different character and voices and all of that, but she's trained to get energy from her audience. That's right. So I definitely picked up on that, that, you know, I, I could totally see it in my mind how someone with good acting skills could absolutely be uh, like the perfect medium like people would right. believe that so yes. very all, very well all of the best uh, characters i think in literature are ambiguous characters we can like them and we can find things they're like human beings that we know exactly exactly you know? I definitely, as a reader, and I know lots of our friends here tonight are the same way when they read, we we sort of gravitate towards those unreliable narrators yes. because they're human, because they're, they're not human. they're they're not characters. Nobody's all exactly. good and nobody's all bad. That's and right. it, it takes a while to sort of figure that out. And I, I definitely got some great enjoyment out of great. getting to know Kit. You got the book. book. You got yes, it. Yes, I did. I did indeed. I, I fell right into it and I was like, okay, now it. I'm hooked. Um, so some of the themes in the book, grief and loss, um, as you've already said, Kit actually has a double loss in her life. She's yes. her, her husband has died in 9-11 and then her daughter as a teenager 
has suffered an accident. It happens early on, so I'm not spoiling anything for anyone. Mm -hmm. She has yep. an accident and ends up in a coma for several years. So she's yes. missing her daughter as well. Even though she is still alive, she's not there with Kit. Exactly. So Kit obviously has a lot of grief going on in her life mm -hmm. and a lot mm -hmm. of trying to deal with loss. So how does that kind of tie in with the story as a whole? As you know, thinking of, of, of people sort of... Um, looking to get that closure can you sort of just talk about some of the things in the in the book that that lead to the feelings of grief and loss sure um i think that what she's doing not only trying to make some money but bringing helping people come to grips with their grief and their loss bringing their 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 loved ones back even for a few minutes at a mm -hmm. session even if she i mean like there's an irish woman Whose, whose daughter has died and, and she can do the accent and she can read people what they're, what they're thinking about, what is it they miss about that, that person. And she can do that for them and she really does bring them comfort. Mm -hmm. So even though she's, I mean, she's not a murderer, she's just a con artist, but she's good. And, and she's known to be good, but grief and loss are the things that everybody experiences. You, you, you can lose your cat has happened to us a few years you know you lose animals you lose family parents and that sort of thing and and there's a you have to come to grips with it and some people don't right mm -hmm. away and some people can't let go and then you think and i think there's a line in the book where maybe we're haunting the dead the living i was going to bring that up yes that that yeah. i thought that was an excellent very astute comment there for i forget yeah. who says it but right so yeah. like maybe i say they're... It. I, it's an narration. <laughs> I, I um, is it Kit in the book that says it to someone, or does someone? I say think it to I her? say that's, it for Kit. Yeah, she okay. thinks this. Yeah, she thinks it. She thinks it. Yeah, and that's really kind of struck me because I was like, oh, sure. Like, why? Why would we assume that that people left behind are the ones being haunted? Maybe the loving are the ones haunting those who have gone. This is exactly. that's a, a real thought provoker. The the early um, psychics in the nineteenth century in England. And, and actually, a lot of this started in Cambridge in England, where I lived okay. for four years. And the Institute for Psychical Research is based there. It's been there since the 1800s. But they talked about the veil between the living and the dead. Mm -hmm. it, 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 can, it can tear. You, you can touch it. You can feel it. Um, you know, you, you live in a, I, I live in a very old house, 1815 house. There are no dead people here. You know, people say, is it haunted? No. It, it's a very benign house. Um, you know, I've, I've lived in a house where odd things may have happened, but this is, this is, this is an old house. People lived here and died in this house mm -hmm. and maybe even buried in the cellar. I don't know. It's an old place, but um, you know, there's that sense of, you know, we come and we go and we may leave something behind. I always think that people don't die as long as we remember them. As long as they are alive in our memories, they're mm -hmm. not dead. Mm -hmm. They're physically not there, but they're there with us. They're with us, right? We we hold them with us in our minds, and I think that's a comforting idea. Absolutely, yeah, that's a really lovely thought. So, what do you? What would you say was the most challenging part? of writing the summoning were there any scenes that you actually if, you, if you've got them tell us a scene that you really enjoyed writing or maybe one that was kind of difficult to write or both what have what have you got you i liked all the, the seance scenes were good because mm -hmm. again it's performative art so she yes. has this little room and she puts down the gray tablecloth she lights the candle and the candle flickers it is it, you create an atmosphere and the atmosphere is extremely important. I don't know if you saw the re recent remake of the movie Nightmare Alley, where a man is a psychic and people were saying, they're talking about the dead and it's in an audience, but he, they create an atmosphere. The way they're dressed, the way they look at people, they're all si sending signs, they're all fakes, you know, mm -hmm. and, but it's just the way they talk to people, you create an atmosphere. And in that little room, they sit across from Kit uh, her clients, and that, and then she she talks. She holds their hands. She's give me something of them that reminds you of them. This is all performative art, and it gets the client in the mood of thinking about that person. And then she can read off of that. 
I think psychics work like that, so-called psychics. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they can sense, you know, you, I, have a, I want to speak to somebody and I, I miss her so much and she, she left me this and you can start building. They're all writers. All, all, they're all writers in a way. And they create a world for you that may last 10, 20, 30 minutes, mm-hmm. but they're writing your life and the death of, you know, your death as well. It's very, I like that you kind of said that creating that atmosphere because yes. it's not right. There's no crystal balls. There's no, you know, drapes over the lights. She doesn't. Right. The she's very, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> she's very professional and kind of no nonsense about it, which is very, I, I really, I got kind of a kick out of that, that it wasn't like, okay, I have to go put on my, my gold earrings and my right. bracelets and my, and you know, thing she, on the head. Yes. When, ha- when Harry Houdini was famous, who was famous for trying to debunk mediums. Right, right. Before he died, he said to his wife, Rose, and he said, if you want to talk to me after I'm dead, I, this is the code, I'm going to send you a line. And she had seances every year. And never key, never came. Never got that code. All right. That is (laughs) see, that's an interesting little trivia fact. So tell us along this line. Um, you know, one of the things I absolutely was sort of struck by is the the very realistic nature of all these scenes. You've got we see Kit going on auditions, Mm -hmm. very realistic. You've got the how the seances are going, very realistic. So tell us a little bit about what kind of, um, if any, research did you do for the book? Did you did you talk to actors and actresses to kind of get a feel for their lives? Did you go visit a medium? And would you go visit a medium? That's uh, well, another I'll question. Take, I, I <laughs> do a very, separate I, question. I actually do very, I make up everything. I okay. do very little research. I mean, okay. I recently wrote a novel in which uh, main character is a private detective. I have no idea. But I, if you make it, the, the trick is, the trick about fiction for me is you can say whatever you like, but that little detail that seems so weird. I once was talking to a French professor who was a specialist in Proust, and I have a particular interest in Proust. And I, we're talking about writing. And I said, there's this little shop on the Rue Jacob in the sixth arrondissement, and I'm describing it to him in detail. And the cat's in the window. And he said, you know, I think I've been there. And I said, I made it all up. But I gave you some uh, details in there, the beaded curtain, the brown bees. Remember the brown bees? That, and I keep telling you this. If you add a detail that just seems eh, a little off, people say, it's so weird. It's got to be real. Yeah. And, and in a way, that's a trick of writing. And so I don't really do a lot of research. If it's a historical subject, recently I wrote on uh, about 1969. And the summer of 69 in LA, um, I was around in 69, but I wasn't in LA. So I had to do some research for that mm-hmm. as well. And I sort of immersed myself in this for about a year, but I just make it up. That's my job. It's it, like improvisation. So I, I know basically how actors work mm-hmm. and I know how auditions work mm-hmm. and I can make up the medium stuff. That's not too tough. So I, I, like, I like to make things up and I write, I mean, I write, a lot of my books have a female protagonist. I'm writing one now with a female protagonist. And they, people say, how can you do, you're a man. How do you, I've grown up with women. I had a mother and two sisters, a wife and a daughter. I've lived with women all my life. So I, I, I don't know everything, but I can, I, I think I've got it. Yeah, definitely. Talk to me a little bit more about, um, uh, let, let's actually talk about Kit specifically. Yes. So when you sat down and you're like, okay, I want to write, these two movies have influenced me. This is something I've always been kind of interested in. You're getting the kernel of the story. How did Kit as a, as a, as a formed person kind of arrive in your brain? Tell us a little well, bit. I had, about I had her name. Nobody's okay. actually asked me about her last name, which is an unusual last name. Capriol. Capriol. Yes. Well, if you, everybody has the secret. If you <laughs> Google Peter Warlock. Okay. He was an English composer. His real name was Philip Hesseltine. Okay. He was involved in a rather well-known English composer of the early 20th century. And he was, he was involved in some drug use, some satanic stuff, but he wrote a piece called the Capriol Suite, which is kind of an Elizabethan pastiche. And I always liked that name. Okay. Boom, done it. I'm going to go look this up when we're done. I'm yeah. right. 
<laughs> See, this is what I love about these interviews, all these little tidbits that you don't get anywhere else, right? Yeah, <laughs> I've never told anybody that. So yeah, so I had the, I had the name and I had the opening scene and I thought, okay. what's, what's a good grabber for a first chapter? And I thought, she's in the, looking in the New York Times and she's looking at memorial notices and then she starts trying to call the person. Goes, you know, your daughter, oh, she's been gone these 10 years, the woman says. And she says, you know, we've spoken a few times recently. Boom, end of chapter. Yeah. And you think, okay, I'm grabbed, I hope. You know, and then and then we come into her story and her story runs parallel to, to the story of, you know, her backstory yes. runs parallel. And we also know that Kit, without, it's not a spoiler really, has had uh, some issues, psychological issues. So you don't really know who is she, what's going on here. And I want that ambiguity to float because like death, we don't know, it's a mystery and Kit's a mystery as well. Mm. I like that in my characters. I like you to sort of say, I don't know, I can't quite grasp her, but I like her. And then, you know, and I, but you know, and I, I, that's like life. Very much that's so. Well, and that's how she becomes very realistic as a, as a character, I feel. Yes. Like this absolutely struck me as, you know, I'm, I got a very clear sense of who she is and what she's about and why she's doing what she's doing. Um, and I was super curious to see if there was going to have, we're going to have some romance there between her and the detective. And so that, when it all culminated that he had been, I don't know, sort of the bad guy for lack of better. He's investigating her. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, that was, that was an interesting kind of lead to, to follow. Um, so, so honestly, would you, um, if you didn't, so you didn't research mediums before this, would you, would you go to a medium if you were? Out of curiosity, yes, but I don't know who I'd want to speak to. I don't think right. I want to speak to my parents, actually, frankly. I had enough of them in my life. So that was fun. Um, I would have just out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, my wife's mother had, was, was very psychic. Okay. And, and uh, she's half Swedish, half Irish. And she saw her uncle the moment he died, he came into her room, he appeared. So she had that. And then her brother is also very psychic. So they, they can sense things mm -hmm. that we cannot sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but I, yeah, I do it out of curiosity but I wouldn't do it because I have one goal. In There's mind. not I'm someone like, you want to contact. Yeah. I don't want to speak to my mother lately, frankly. Got it. <laughs> Oh, she was great, but you know, I didn't like right. that. You know, done. Right. You drive me crazy, you know. <laughs> She'll tell you to pick your clothes up off the floor or something, right? Right, right. <laughs> Finish your milk. <laughs> yeah, right. Awesome. So um, what else can I ask you about without giving too much away? Um, I think that is there, so you, um, you chose the the events of 9-11 to sort yes. of center the book in so that we get a sense of where Kit's grief is coming from, very impactful event, which also sort of lends a little bit more, what's the word I'm looking for? It almost makes Kit seem a little bit more scammy than your average medium because she's, mm -hmm. she's picking a national tragedy right. to sort of get money off of right yes so how did you how did you kind of approach that i you know you you never sort of um put it in a bad light or or make um you know a sensationalize it you don't sensationalize it mm -hmm. so how did you feel writing about an actual event that happened that impacted thousands of people how did you feel like do i you know did you feel like i need to tread carefully or did you just kind of go for it and it oh no it I, no i was yeah. very I was, I'm a New Yorker, so of course, right, you know, I felt right. this. I knew the area. My daughter was about a mile and a half away when this happened. She was at NYU and, uh, you know, they had to evacuate immediately. Yeah. So, but um, I did know that after World War I, around 1918, 1919, in England, mediums, mediumship became big. Oh, sure. People Be lost, you know, they lost yeah. a whole generation. I People wanted to speak that. to their husbands, their, their sons, yes. they lost everybody. And there's a sense of loss, tremendous sense of loss. So after a tragedy like that, you find that. Now, for instance, in this past Sunday's New York Times, there was an article about people researching mediums. And one of them said, um, 
who was the daughter of a medium, granddaughter of a medium, said you had people coming and asking if souls can survive in an airplane that hit the tower. So people were doing that for them. I didn't know that when I wrote the book, but I figured this is a national tragedy. And it's the, you know, Arthur Conan Doyle lost a son in World War I, and this went to one seance after another, after another, uh, with Houdini at, at some times. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is this, this horrible tragedy, and they can't deal with it because it's so sudden. You can't believe it. that They were there one day, she'd seen her husband that morning, and then he's gone. Mm -hmm. And she has all she has is a recording, which we don't read in the book, that he left her while he was in the tower. So we don't know what he said, because I thought, let the reader figure that out. Yeah, yeah. I want the reader to use his or her imagination reading my books. So you don't know what's going to happen, but it was a huge event. And she's trying to help these people and also trying to make a living, you know. Right. Awesome. All right. You know, I know uh, people have been sending their questions into the Google form. And so mm -hmm. our friends at Sourcebooks will start giving me those soon. So let's move into our trivia portion so people can continue to come up with some more questions for you. Um, and we'll just transition into this. So let's have some trivia. Our friends at Sourcebooks will pop up three questions on the screen. We're going to test your knowledge on famous people in history who believed in communicating with the dead. So the polls will appear and our audience is going to pick their, their best answer and then we'll let everybody know what the, an what the correct answer is at the end. Meanwhile, JP, Mm -hmm. I would like you to tell us, if you can, uh, some of the things that you like to read. Now, I know you and I had a brief conversation in our practice session, um, because I always like to ask authors, do you read the sorts of things that you write? Why or why not? So tell us about, tell us about whether or not you read thrillers. I do not. <laughs> so, I, do ah. not I do not read thrillers <laughs> for a very good reason is that I don't want to be influenced by them. Mm -hmm. I like to watch them. I really enjoy thriller series. And there's a lot of series about disappearing children. I did that in The Drowning. Yes. And I wanted to do something very different with it. Uh, movies, love them, great, love to see them. And I can steal what I need as I yes. go along. Yeah. <laughs> and I do, I admit to that. But I don't read thrillers. I really don't read a lot of contemporary fiction. Uh, when I'm writing, which I, I'm doing, I do every day, I try to not to read sort of what I'm writing, if you know okay. what I mean. So I read, I reread a lot of classics. Recently, uh, last summer, I reread after 50 years Crime and Punishment because it, uh, for a novel I just recently finished uh, about guilt. How do you how do you contain guilt? Because the novel is about a man who is a very respected uh, educator, but he has a secret, and it goes back 40 years, and it involves a very very bad thing that happened in 1969, and he was there, and I. How do you hold that within you? So Crime and Punishment sort of made me think a little bit about that. Um, I recently, I like the writer Roberto Bolaño, who's had quite a, quite a vogue recently, uh, the, the uh, Chilean writer. And I reread uh, his big, huge 3,000, 2,000 page book, uh, uh, 2666, because I'm doing a novel now about trafficking. And okay. even though his is not about trafficking, I wanted to get this sense of, of tremendous loss and disappearing people and whatnot. So I read a lot of French writers okay. because they've influenced me a great deal. So apart from Proust, who was sort of my touchstone author, that's that ambiguity of character I learned from Proust a long time ago. I reread Pat Patrick Modiano, who is a Nobel laureate in literature from 2014, writes these wonderful books that are kind of detective stories. And, um, you know, he goes through, the narrator is always trying to find out what happened in my life. What did I miss? Modiano's father was in the black market in Paris during the occupation. He was Jewish. And his mother was an actress from Belgium. And he was born in 1945. But the occupation of France, the Nazi occupation, has always weighed on him. Um, I, re -re I read Jean-Patrick Monchette, who's translated into English. M-A-N-C-H-E-T-T-E, great thriller writer. But I, when you read them in French, you're, not, you're being influenced in a different way, if you know what I mean. Yes. Um, I read a nonfiction that may have nothing to do with what I'm, I'm doing, biographies and that sort of thing. So I'm, because I write all day, 
this is what I do all day. I write. Well, I've done it for all my life, my adult life. So I, the reading comes later on. All right. But no thriller writers. Sorry. No thriller writers. That is very interesting. I think that um, I always am curious, especially with thrillers more than any other genre, if authors read in that, because as you said, you don't want to be influenced. And I always mm -hmm. kind of wonder about that. If, if people are like, oh, maybe I should stay away from my preferred genre. <laughs> and actually, I think it works for me because people have said to me, Yours is so, you're, you're like the drowning or, or the summoning. It's so completely different from other throwers. And I'm going, that's a great plus. That is, yes. That's, that's, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, you know. that, that, so that's that's it's quite the compliment there, right? You don't want everybody yeah, I to love it, yeah. right? This is, this is not that, your, your girl book. Uh, we, we, in the library world, we like to sort of poke a little bit of, of fresh course. fun at the girl books. Um, gotcha. you know, in the girl gotcha. in the window, girl on the train, girl under That's the right. bus. I don't know, right? Yeah. Girl under the bus. Not... <laughs> right. So okay, well, um we have closed out our trivia. So let's have them pop up the answers for us. So question one, which monarch often spoke to mediums to seek political advice? Uh, the correct answer is Queen Victoria, which is mm -hmm. what the majority picked. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. All right. Very smart. I love Vlad the Impaler. <laughs> yeah, I like that too. Right? He, he, right. Probably, he probably did too, for all we know. That's right, yeah. All right. Second question. Which famous yeah. author became convinced it was possible to communicate with the dead after their child died? And that is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. All right. And then question three, which famous artist held regular seances to influence their art? Most people thought it was Frida Kahlo, but it's actually Hilma of Klint. Right. I went to her exhibition at the Guggenheim Museum to see yes. that. Yes. Very, yes. Very interesting artist. There you go. So thank you all for participating in the trivia. If you did so, we've got you electronically recorded. Big Brother is watching. Um, and we will add you into the uh, mystery book bundle prize package at the end. But now we have just about 30 minutes to finish up here with our questions from the audience. So I'm going to dive right into that. Okay. So we've got this question here from Carly, who would like to know. So she says, you've you mentioned that you almost always start with character. Mm -hmm. What helps you understand your characters and what steps do you take to fully develop them? Um, I put them in a situation, in, in a situation that immediately begins, in, not in conflict necessarily, but at an angle to the world. Ooh. So like Kit is at an angle to the world, mm -hmm. just at that slight angle to the world. Um, all, of my, all of my books, I think, I've done that with subconsciously, if you know what I mean. I develop them because the minute you put them there, they have a richness. And you have, like human beings, you have to you have to use that richness to develop them over time. You have to space out things. You can't just throw them all on page one and go, he's so and so and she so and so, and boom, 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 boom. You got to space that out. So certain revelations come when they need to come later on in the book. So that's that's kind of an, it's an intuitive thing. Okay. Writing for me is not mechanical; it's intuitive. It's 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 a little more akin to jazz. And one of the things about jazz is that, as they always say, you learn your instrument, you know the notes, and then you can do anything with it. Mm -hmm. uh, Jimi Hendrix and John Coltrane both fell asleep with either a saxophone or a guitar because they practiced all day long. I tell young writers that. You got to work at it. I had to write 12 books before my first novel was ever published. And that was my oh. 13th. So I was writing, I, I had to leave the country to do it, which is even <laughs> strange. I couldn't get, I couldn't get published there. It was, you couldn't get an agent back in the seventies mm -hmm. without being published. And you couldn't get a publisher without an agent. Uh -huh. And I had a couple of editors at you know Viking Press and Little Brown who were interested in me, but I moved to England and two weeks later I had an agent. Fascinating. I got I got very lucky, and uh, and he stuck with me for five years until I got a book published. So oh, how interesting! Yeah. Oh, all right. Uh, we have another question here from Casey, who would like to know how do you yourself describe your writing style? 
uh, relentless. Ah, <laughs> no, my, my writing style is, I think it's, it's, I think it's both, uh, that's a great question, Casey, thank you. I think it's both quite clear and readable, but it's also, it takes your travels, you have to travel with it. So that I may begin a sentence here, and then you find out that you're in Schenectady or in, in Buffalo or so, mm -hmm. you're in a whole different town, so that it gets you there. You have to read it carefully. But I try to make the writing style as clear, as readable as possible. And within that sentence, there have to be little detours. So you get a okay. sense of tone, you get a sense of voice. Voice is very important to me in a character. We wanna hear that voice. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm now writing a novel about it. The main character is a 16 year old Russian orphan in America. And I've got that, we're, I, I'm Russian by background. Don't hold okay. it against me. We're in a war, I know. <laughs> But I mean, we came, became in the early part of the 20th century, but I have that East European accent. My grandmother had it. I lived mm -hmm. with it for a long time. So I've got the accent in my head. And my, my very first novel was about Russians too, so. So I'm gonna take a little tangent here, side question. Sure. When you're writing, since voice is important to you, do you yeah. find yourself, do you speak any of your character's dialogue out loud to? I, I whisper as I write. Okay. My, right, my wife see? says she knows I'm writing because I'm talking to myself. <laughs> I, I wish that. I absolutely do. I, I listen to the rhythm. I write for okay. the ear more than for the eye. Okay. So uh, I, I think that makes writing, it gives it a texture, yep. which I think is very important. You mm -hmm. have to sort of chew on it, those sentences. I want mm -hmm. that. So I, yeah, I, I, I talk to myself when I'm writing. I All love it. I love it. This is, let's see this again, those tidbits that you don't get. I also, I also write when I'm sleeping. I wake up. Oh, with, tell me about that. <laughs> oh, I once, I once, after my first novel was published, this was a long time ago, I woke up with an entire novel in my head. I had the title, I had the characters, and I wrote the thing, and I sent it to my agent in London, who really liked it, and sent it to my editor there, and he said, well, it's, it's both a thriller and it's a literary novel, and we don't know what to do with it, so it never got published, but I still really? have it. Wow. But I, I, will, I will sometimes, you know, go to bed, and be thinking about, how do I solve this? And then 4.30 in the morning, I'll wake up and I've got it. That is fascinating. Oh, thank I you did, for sharing that with us. I, I, I did that with the drowning. I woke up, I, I needed to solve something. My editor, mm -hmm. Anna Michaels said, you got to figure this one out. It's not too tough. And I woke up at 4.30 on a Saturday morning. I came down, I wrote to her. I said, I've got it. It's 4.30 in the morning. Boom, I got it. I love work. it. Oh, that is really cool. Thank you for sharing that tidbit with You're us. Welcome. As a reader, I will often read, especially dialogue out loud to myself as I'm reading. Just if, if, whenever, if there's a sentence that really strikes me, I will sort of put myself in character and, and listen to it Good. out loud. And, and I, so that's, that's pro, proactive reading is very yes, important. Yes, I love right? it. I congratulate you. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Um, so let's see here. More fabulous questions. Now, I was going to ask this earlier, but I figured someone in the audience would ask it, and they did. We have another Another one from Casey, who knowing your background as a screenwriter, so I wanted to ask it, but Casey asks, if The Summoning became a movie, and I was thinking either movie or like Netflix miniseries, yeah, mini who would you like to see in the cast? Well, Kit could be anybody. There are great actors, women actors. Mm -hmm. And I say actor on purpose because I hate the idea of actress and actor. Mm -hmm. I know it's an award ceremony thing, but <laughs> women are actors and men are actors. You don't have to give them a different name. Um, I would think that's kind of wide open. Uh, it could be anybody in in Hollywood. It, I mean, it really could be uh -huh. because you, you know of that of that age. She's forty yes. years old, and it gives it gives forty year old actors. Uh, 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 I was but, just going mean, to say, there's not enough roles for meaty, you know, meaty roles for forty year old women. So uh, I agree. I agree. Let's all sure. start campaigning Netflix right now, guys. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, and the drowning, too. drowning. Everybody says the drowning would be a great series. You know, it's about a kid who disappears. Great. Easy to cast. All right. Do you approach screenwriting the same way that you write your novels? Or is that a separate kind of process? Just out it of is separate. I, I haven't been writing screenplays for a few years now, simply okay. because I've been spending so much time in my novels. But what I did get from writing screenplays was how to structure, how to structure a thriller. Because all of my, most of my novels from the first 
I've written, I've published now nine books. I've written maybe 24 books in okay. my life. But I, they were always literary novels when I lived in England, but they always had a thriller aspect. It could be a mystery, it could be a thriller aspect, but they've always played with that. When I wrote The Drowning, I said, I'm gonna write a thriller. Boom, and it was a thriller from beginning to end. But I brought some of the, what I knew about screenwriting and structure and how to play with time how, how to drop hints when they need to be dropped, how to manipulate the audience. The drowning is all about the manipulation of one person by another without mm -hmm. giving away too much. And, and a very bad person who's being manipulated by a very clever person. And uh, the, movies are, are manipulation, just like books are. We go watch a movie and then we go, oh my God, that, what that happened? How'd that happen? How'd that happen? You know, so you drop those things in and you're being pushed and pulled around that's that's kind of fun mm -hmm. so yeah I, I would apply that to that sure okay all right uh we have a question coming in here from claire who would like to know so she says i was fascinated by the medical condition of kit's daughter zoe so yes. um as we mentioned earlier there has been an accident where she's fallen hit her head and she's in this years-long coma now right, where right. she is she opens her eyes but no one knows if she can hear if she can understand anything so mm -hmm. claire is wondering how much of zoe's condition is based on real science like is that is that yes, people in comas? yes. I, I did some research she's in a kind of a okay. twilight coma twilight which okay. is I, which is there's a word very for very important for the book because just as kit has a foot in the living and a foot in the dead. Yes. She does not realize right away. So it is her daughter. She is in this twilight zone, so to yes. speak, mm -hmm. where you don't know what she's aware of. And she witnessed what a terrible accident in a subway station in New York. She saw a woman falling on foot in front of a train. Very important part of the story, as you mm -hmm. know. And and we don't, she's a witness to it. And she's in a hospital. That's, I'm going to leave it at that. Boom. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, I did some research. I did do some research into it. Uh, the fall would have caused the coma. Uh, plus, there was a trauma aspect to it. Mm -hmm. But I don't. I don't want to. I didn't want to get into a lot of technicalities in the book, because it just becomes like exposition. Right. Mm -hmm. And I just figured, you know, readers will figure it out. They, of course, they're smart. Never mm -hmm. underestimate your readers. That is a very good declaration. Yes. All right, so we've got more questions here. And this is something I also wanted to ask and I, I sort of figured someone else would as well. So first we have a comment and then leading into a question. So okay. we've got Miriam who says, I found the suspense slash thriller aspects of this book to be very subtle. And that's how I felt when I was reading it too. You, you kind of walk right up to being sort of scary ghost story horror and then pull back. And I felt as a reader, I enjoyed that because it sort of left me to my own devices as to how yes. scared I was going to be, right? If that yes. makes any sense. Um, yes. So sort of dovetailing with that, the, there's a question here from Donna. Hi, Donna. We love Donna. She asks fabulous questions. Um, so she would like to know, how do you define the line between supernatural suspense and horror novels? When does the former become the latter? And as a librarian, I was thinking about that when I was reading this because I thought this would be the perfect book to recommend to someone who does not like horror horror right they don't want gory stuff they right. don't want to be visited by poltergeists you know it just it right. sort of walks right up to that line of oh my gosh mm -hmm. are there going to be dead people in my apartment okay right. no pull back so tell us a little bit about that one, line. Th one thing I don't do in my books uh, two things I don't do I don't write sex scenes because they're just okay. dull and they stop everything dead. And there's a reason why in Britain they have the bad sex award and it goes to people like Salman Rushdie, you know, it goes to John Updike because yes. it just, it just, it just yes. takes the heart out of a book. The You're board. very smart to stay away from that. The imagination of the reader is very important. I don't do any gore, any torture, any children torture, animal torture. I don't touch that stuff. I'm dealing with things that are very psychological, which yes. is much more interesting to me. Thing, and if reason. something, if there's a violent event I'm going to refer to, I'll do it tangentially and so that you, you, you sense it, but you don't have to see it because the reader can do that herself. 
Yes, that's, I definitely felt that way. And, and I know a lot of our participants tonight being library people are always kind of, you know, I think we library folks are a little special as readers because we are reading for enjoyment, but we're also reading for work. And so, yes. you know, I think every book that we read, we're trying to think, who do I know would like this? What kind of patron is going to come and, you know, who could I recommend this to? And that I definitely thought, okay, this is just walking up to that line of scary, but not scary. So people right. who are like, I could never read a ghost story. I could never read about supernatural would totally be into this because it's very right. subtle, like like Miriam said. Right. And speaking of Miriam, oh, go ahead. Go no, right no, ahead. no, please. No, no. I was just going to say, speaking of Miriam, so she's got a great comment here that she says she loved when you said the book's character is kind of in a twilight zone because, right, mm -hmm. this reminded her of the twilight zone, that surprise twist. I was also thinking uh, people who like Black Mirror would sort of yes. get into this because, Absolutely. you know, it's 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 fallible human beings sort of tricking and, and yeah, so anyway, exactly. just wanted to say that. I love those twists at the end. Um, so let's see here. We have uh, just about 10 minutes left and I've got more questions here. So we've got uh, Fred who says he really enjoys the last lines in your chapters. How do you decide how to end your chapters? Talk to us a little the, bit about that writing style wise. The, chap the chapters tell me there is a there's a shape almost like a physical shape as I see okay. it to a chapter. I mean, today I ended a chapter, I had the perfect line for it. And I thought that's great. And it was just there. It just boom, popped into my head. But what it does is it opens the door to the next chapter. Okay. Some people call them cliffhangers. I like to think of them as a door opening. Oh, there's another room. Let's find out what's going on here. So that's how I like to do it. I don't like to be heavy handed. I don't know what thriller writers do. I mean, I've read like John the Carré, but he's a spy mm -hmm. writer, right? And he's a very good writer. But I, I don't do any heavy handed stuff. No people running around with axes and blood and whatnot. I just try to make it, what's gonna happen here now? So keep you curious. It's, again, it's the, it's the reader is the important person here. Mm -hmm. Well, how can I bring that reader to this point and then say, now turn the page. Yes, that that I never thought about that. That a that an author kind of has to think about that, right? Yes. That you know, where is the point that I'm going to make sure this person wants to stay up past their bedtime, which I did <laughs> to read this. And and yeah, so that that's great. Thank you for sharing that with us. Sure. Um, and along those veins, because we like to get this sort of how do you write? Everybody always wants mm -hmm. to know that. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your writing style. What is you said you were writing all the time. You write in your sleep. So tell us a day in the life of author J.P. Smith. Well, I wake up, <laughs> I have a shower, I have <laughs> breakfast. I read the New York Times and I look at Facebook and Twitter and things like that. And then I sit down and I write and I, I know what I have to do. Uh, I think it was Hemingway who said, never end your day in the bottom of the mountain, always end it at the top so that you have a place to go on the way down. So I always know like tomorrow, I know what my, I know what my assignment is for tomorrow. Okay. I, I, have, I found a whole new way of introducing a character in the novel I'm writing on, but 125 pages into it. And I thought, great, that's exciting. So I know what to do. So I, I play with it. I go back, I rewrite the last 10 pages. Okay. When I used to write scripts, every day I would start a page one. The script is about 110 pages long. So I would write, I would start page one every day, page one every day, and then move up and then add another five or 10 pages, page one the next day. So that anything I do later on, oh. I will come back and be able to plant the seed yeah. for it. So with the novel, with the summoning, I wrote it maybe 25 times. I would go back to page one. So the minute I have a new plot point and a new say character comes in, I go back to page one. Okay. So I'm, I'm polishing the writing. So it's pretty well edited by then. And then I need to, if I need to add things or drop little hints in or that sort of thing. So it's, it's, you're building, it's like, it's like doing cookery, I suppose. You know, it's like, you have to sure. go back and look at the recipe again. Gee, I left something out. Got to do this. Got to do that. I'm missing a flavor. It's like that. 
Oh, that's fascinating. Thank you that's for sharing that. I love that. That I never, I never thought about that, that that's right to go back to the beginning every time to catch all your kind of exactly. catch all your ideas. Yeah. Yes, oh, well, exactly. Thanks for sharing that with us. That's really great. You, you want to have that continuous, it's got to be an organic thing that you're creating. Yes. It's not just a book. It's just this organic life yes. that you're creating. And you want to go back and make sure we know where everything fits. We want to have, where does this, where does this trend begin? Oh, it begins a little earlier. Great. Right. I can do that. Oh, that's so interesting. Fabulous. All right. Along the same line of thinking, I've got a question here from Emma who would like to know, um, what is the best piece of writing advice you've ever gotten? <laughs> Take a moment. Mentor, I wouldn't expect you to do that right off the top of your head. My mentor, my mentor, who's now long gone, my mentor was a, a, a professor of mine in college and he was a published author. And he wants the best piece of advice he said to me is on publication day, nobody knows you. You walk down the street, they're not, they don't think that you're, he, and he taught me that it is, this is a business. This is what you do. And okay. actually the, my best piece of advice was when I lived in England, it was like acting, acting in England. It's, it's a job. Uh, there's a great story about John Hurt, the actor, John Hurt, mm -hmm. who was doing a, sh a film and he was doing a shot with an American and the, they were taking a break. And the next scene, it was going to be the end of a running. The guy's, John Hurt is running after this guy. And they're supposed to be breathless and red faced. And John Hurt's having a cup of tea and a cigarette. And the American's doing jumping jacks and push ups. He's trying to get himself into a sweat. The director says, All right, gentlemen, take your marks. And he goes, OK, let's begin. John Hurt doubles over, turns red, and starts sweating. And the American actor says, How do you do that? He said, It's acting. It's they pay me to do this. So writing, I always learned from talking to English writers, it's it's what you do. It's your job. It's your day job. It's your job. It is your job. And mm -hmm. it's, there's nothing mystical about it. Again, it's mastering that instrument, knowing the notes. You have a style. By this time in life, I have a style. And mm -hmm. knowing, how to, knowing how to play it and sing it. So I just do it every day. Love that. Seven days a week. Seven days, seven days, and even in your sleep. I mean, that's just, in my sleep. you are. Yes. So, so do you, do you think you were born to be a writer? That's just a question off of my, no, no, I actually, mean, it feels probably, like started, talking to you. I'm like, how could you have possibly yeah. done anything else with your life? <laughs> well, I'll tell you when I was, when I was a kid, my, my mother used to read like the book, New York Times book review and this Saturday review of books, which was a magazine. And I used to look at the photos as a little boy of the writers and they had ties and they had cigarettes. And I go, I want to do that too. <laughs> I think they look cool. Uh, Rod Serling looked cool to me. Yes, he had the right. kind of flinty three martini look and he had the cigarette, mm -hmm. he looked cool. Mm -hmm. But I actually wanted to be a musician. And uh, when I was in college, well, actually I wanted to be a rock star because that was a perfectly reasonable occupational choice in the sixties. <laughs> I wanted to be a rock God I and I it. played bass. I played bass, I was in a band, made money. And, uh, and then I realized this is not gonna be an easy thing. And when I finished my work for my master's degree, I sat down and I said to my, to my then girlfriend, now wife, I'm going to write. And I started writing. And it, I thought, oh, you're right. You send it off to the publisher. It gets published. Boom. No, 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 no. Not that easy. <laughs> not that easy. But I started the, getting in the habit of doing it every day. When okay. I was a teacher for four years, I would teach all of these really pretty good kids at a private school, my old school. And then I come back and write 20 pages every day, 20 pages every day. It doesn't matter how good or bad it was, 20 pages a day. And then I correct their papers and whatnot. And I'd be exhausted, but that's what I did. So you, it's, it's habit. It's learning discipline. Got and it. That's so very, you've, very important. You've got, you've got not only the, the soul of a writer, but then you have to practice at it as well. That's, you've got to practice it. If like you don't practice it, you lose it. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, I think we've got, we're going to do one more question. Um, what are you working on next? Can you, can well, you give us finished, a sneak peek of your, of your next novel? Or can you tell I finished, about it? I finished a book again about this, this educator who's got this secret and that 40 years earlier, he was a, 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 a member of the Manson family and was involved not in the Tate LaBianca murders, but in another murder, which is fictional. And he, has, he holds a secret within him. He's oh. highly respected in the charitable community in New York City and he also knows the whereabouts of a child who was kidnapped and can't say anything about it because it doesn't want to endanger her. 
That book is done. The book I'm writing now, which I'm about 125 pages into, is about an orphan, it's about trafficking. And okay. about a 16 year old Russian girl who was brought to America. She's very smart and she's very canny. And I'm loving writing this character. Oh, fun. Yeah. That sounds good. I love secrets. I love skeletons in the closet. I love unreliable narrators. So I will definitely uh, be picking up your next couple of books for Thank sure. You. Thank you. So I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up there. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been a, it's been a great pleasure. I loved chatting with you. And thank you to everyone who participated tonight. Um, we'll have, oh, we've got the winners coming up in the chat right there. Claire Roberts, you've won the gift card. And then we've got the book bundle winners. We've got Miriam Khan, Casey Sullivan, and Rose Marcini. Uh, if you, uh, the four of you could email emily.ludoff at sourcebooks.com so she can get their prizes out to you. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. JP, it really has been a pleasure to chat with you tonight. Thank you for taking it's, time. It's out been of my your... pleasure. It's this been my pleasure. Just... You, it was delightful. I love it. Oh, great. You know, I really I... feel... One of the things that, that draws people to these events and one of the things I love about doing them is getting these little tidbits into the writing process and into a writer's life. And you have shared a lot with us. So thank you for and being I, and so I want to thank I, I want to thank all the participants who listened in and asked questions. I appreciate We have that a all. great crew here that they are really, they're devoted to books. They're devoted to authors. This and we need people being, like that. Right? The we need library you. people are the best people ever. You bet. So you thank bet. you all for being the best people and thank you for joining us. And make sure that you join us for our next Mystery at the Library event. This next one is going to be Wednesday, April 27th. Same bat time, same bat channel, as they used to say, 7 p.m. Eastern. I'll be talking to Ashley Winstead, the author of the addictive propulsive thriller, In My Dreams, I Hold a Knife. The registration information is there on the chat, so snatch that up real quick. You can also find it on the Sourcebook social media accounts and on the Library Reads social media accounts. We'll, we'll post all that so you can register and join us again. Thanks again to one and all. Have a wonderful evening and happy reading, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, all. Bye.